Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for being on our webinar today. Um, we're going to be quite short and sweet on this one. As you know, we've just allocated half an hour, but um, I'm hoping that, you know, you do get the key objective for us as well as what the key pillars are of customer CIAM. Uh, so this is not just addressing WSO's two identity server product, which of course, um, is what, what we like to look at, but it's to give you some education and I'm hoping that we might be able to follow on with that a little bit later. So just to um, give a bit of housekeeping, we do have a Q&A down the bottom of the screen. Um, to keep it simple, if you wouldn't mind putting your questions there and we can answer those at a little bit more of a later stage. And um, what we'll do without further ado, I'll move forward. So as mentioned to a few of you that are just joining, I'm the IAM Client Director for Australia New Zealand and we've got our Senior Solution Architect who will be doing most of this session with you, which is Robin Anthony. Thank you very much. So we'll look at um, the next slide, please, Robin. A little bit about WSO2. Um, a key thing about us and a key differentiator to us in the market is we're 100% open source. Um, and I'm sure as some of you developers would know, we are very developer friendly, which enables de the developers ease of use, very easily integration and um, open source, which means that we um, are vendor agnostic, which is a key differentiator in the market. Um, vi viably, ve very financially backed, which goes back to 2005 by Cisco, Toba Capital and significant growth in the business, especially over the last one to one to two years with 600 plus customers and 150 new customers. Um, so for some of you, you may know us from the API integration space. However, CIAM is a very strong portfolio within our business and um, across the ANZ region, um, there's a lot of emphasis on new employees. We've put approximately seven people on to date with additional headcount this year and into next year. So we're, we're really ramping up in that side of our business. Um, also from a partner perspective and from a marketing and um, brand awareness out there. So hopefully you'll be able to see us a little bit more as we move forward. Um, well established, as you can see in the um, major capital cities, Sydney, of course, and with our employees, 800 plus employees, but still come back to our core roots, which is 50% in engineering. And I think as a lot of people will know, that is very important in terms of future roadmap for Siam investment with the company within engineering, which is something that we're very proud to tell the market. And um, we have a very strong engineering support background across the globe, which I would say from my early tenure in the business is a, another differentiator to us in um, the marketplace. So without further ado on that, um, I'll hand this over to Robin to give you the technical background. Thank you, Nicole. Hi, everyone. I'm Robin. I'm a solutions architect with WSO2. Um, I work in the industry for about 11 years, both integrating IAM and SIEM systems with uh, customer expectations and requirements. Um, so yeah, we're just here to discuss the uh, five pillars of CIAM. But before we do that, I'd like to share the slide. So what we do in WSO2 is uh, we build open technologies and we help organizations build agile digital businesses. So there are four key areas in any digital transformation journey. And that's what you can actually see. Here. And we have four main products to actually help cater to that. The API management requirements, they're taken care of by WSO2's API manager. Our enterprise integrator stack helps take care of integrations with respect to microservices. The IAM capabilities or CIAM requirements are handled by WSO2 identity server. It handles both identity and access management. Additionally, analytics requirements are handled by stream processing. So moving on to the challenges that people face today in CIAM. Digital tech constantly changes the way that you know, customers integrate with our brands and services. And since all of this is about customers and customers uh, interacting with the brand, 
Um, CIAM, which is again, a subset of IAM, it's a fundamental layer in building a quality or a very trustworthy customer experience. So customers used to see digital channels as a mechanism for interacting with products or services um, and use that to build deeper online relationships with brands. But if you actually fast forward to today, and especially with the COVID-19 effect, digital channels are becoming the only mechanisms that can be used by people to reach out to products and services that they want. So CIAM, or Custom Identity and Access Management, has become a critical part of today's digital business. In general, CIAM also drives revenue growth, and it does this by leveraging identity data to acquire new customers or retain existing customers. CIM also helps build IAM-centric ecosystems that can then be used to convert casual or anonymous users to loyal customers. So if you think about a typical customer onboarding journey, right? What happens is you have an anonymous user who navigates to our website and views things on it for the first time. What we then do is we identify this anonymous user as a web vista and we store this information in our marketing system. This can be location related or info of the device that was used to access our site or how to get to us. And if they actually like our products or services that we offer, they may read more information on our website, such as watch, or they might even decide to go about and watch some videos or maybe download some of the data they've seen or want more of. So in this case, what happens is they additionally provide their email information so that they can get access to that data. What we can then do is identify that individual with an email address, and we can then store that information in our systems, especially as sales systems. So this user who was initially an anonymous user has become a lead at that moment. And that lead will then talk on to salespeople or even chat with maybe a company chatbot expressing interest in buying a products or services. And then the next step is you, to purchase those products, they will then have to provide even more additional information. So at this stage, the anonymous list has become a lead who then gets identified as a customer and that might actually require an account in our system. So we store this user information and it can be attributes such as email addresses, mobile number and so forth. And all of this would need to be verified and maintained by the CIM system. So while there may be some vari variations in onboarding customers or customer journeys, this is at its core, the most simplest one about how an anonymous user can be converted to a customer within the consumer IM solution. And when you look at this use case or this um, little scenario, you can see that there might be several challenges here. So you can begin with integrations. During the initial onboarding, we first store the information in the marketing system. And then once they try to download or fetch the additional data, we put them on the sales system. And then you go on to put the user-related information in the identity and access management system. So even if you take the initial onboarding process, there are several components that we have to connect to. And even after this user becomes a customer, there are still multiple applications to deal with. So there can be let's say a rewards program or maybe a customer care portal and so forth. So there are many applications that the consumer might try to access and we have to integrate all these systems. And what we've also seen is about a 52% of marketing leaders feel that it's a challenge to integrate these disconnected consumer data sources. Around a third of these marketing leaders also say that their inability to integrate this kind of data is a key obstacle for the success of the analytic systems. Also, if we compare a CIAM scenario with a typical workforce scenario, right? So when you look about this, a workforce scenario is something that happens within an organization, internal to it. Whereas the CIAM side of it is dealing with the clients. So what happens here is within an organization, you can have thousands of users in a workforce situation, but you can actually hit millions of users in a CIAM one. And these millions of users, they can also reside across different geographical locations. So we also need to protect all this personal information and adhere to privacy regulations enforced by different countries around the world. So when we try to address these challenges from the outside, 
and if you're looking at from the outside in a CIM solution, you can see different features we use. You can talk about things like progressive uh, profiling. And what that is, is identifying an anonymous user and then going through the journey to convert this anonymous user to a customer. So in the initial phase, you get very, very minimal information. But at the end, once you've actually built a trust relationship with the customer, you get more user information. And that's how progressive profiling works. And this, as the time actually goes by, we collect user info and you then build the user profile continuously. So also with regards to single sign-on, how we ensure that customers have a consistent login experience with the same credential across all the apps, the access in that specific organization. So to provide SSO, CIM solutions also have to support open standards such as OIDC, SAML, WS Federation, OAuth, and so on. So another feature here is user profile management. So most CIM solutions provide a customer care portal where customers can log in and change their preferences or settings. And because of all of this, authentication also has a very big role to play over here. So all the customers should be able to authenticate and verify the user accounts before they access any system. So customers can use different channels to access the system. You can, you can be talking about a laptop or maybe a smartphone. So you have multiple devices. Because of all of this, omni-channel access support is a very key requirement in a typical CIAM solution. So I just explained how things look like from outside the CIM system, but when we build a complete CIM solution, there are five key features that you need to focus on, and these are very important. So these five features that you see on the slide are the five pillars of CIM. You got API and integration, you got scalability, you got strong and adaptive authentication, you got analytics, and you got security and privacy. So you need to make sure that when designing and implementing any CIM solution, you put in sufficient effort in implementing these requirements, the critical. So let's start with the very first one here, which is APIs and integration. About 60% of digital transformation projects, they start with an integration. And when we think about CIM systems, they're not an all-in-one solution. They need to be integrated with different kinds of systems. So the ability to integrate with these other components in a larger ecosystem and the ability to share information with these other systems are very powerful capabilities. The key enabler for integrations are APIs. So any CIM system should provide APIs to do various integrations. And with these integrations, other applications can do, let's say identity analytics, or they can do provisioning or deprovisioning the user information to the CIM system or from the CIM system to those applications. They can perform things like consent management, or auditing these consents and so on. The CIM system includes components to manage user information. So it should also have the ability to expose this user information via REST API. And this is so that other existing applications can invoke these APIs and fetch the user information. And it will also help when we onboard a new application because it becomes easier to get access to that user info. And what this does is it helps speed up the time to market for these new apps. So CM systems would also be able to integrate with data storage or directory services, CRM or relationship customer relationship management systems, marketing solutions, e-commerce platforms, any kind of fraud detection systems. So most businesses we see are unique. And what that means is when they build a customer engaging platform or a CIM platform, those platforms are also unique. So you also have business requirements that keep changing rapidly, right? So if you think about the current situation in the world, most organizations that want to stay in business and stay relevant, they should have an online delivery capability. So the system should be able to cater to a new requirement or uniqueness that the business needs. And when we need to extend these capabilities in the solution, APIs play a very major role. So we know why APIs are important here, but if you expose these, we should also, we should also be able to consider things like security, especially API security. And this is mostly handled by an API gateway in the CIM solution. So having an API gateway, just, it just doesn't help provide security, but it can also help you with 
API discovery, monetization, or monitoring, and so on. The uh, next pillar that we saw is with regards to scalability. So if you look at today's customers, right, they expect services and products to always be available. And these customers access our systems from multiple channels. So we're talking about, if you're just talking about sheer numbers, yeah, it's, it's very large. You're talking about hundreds of thousands to millions of customers, and they can in turn access via multiple channels. So it's very important for them to have the same experience through all of that without delays. So any CIM system must be able to accommodate for all of these users and their variations or spikes in usages or spikes in interactions with the system. And you should do all of this while maintaining a very high level performance. So as an example, we actually worked with the financial institution a while ago. And what they wanted to do was to build a CIM solution for around 1.5 million customers with the ability to handle 35,000 users logging in on any given day with three peak times listed through the day and around 1,700 logins per minute. And this is the regular usage scenario, but they also had a very special scenario where they expected very high load for two days in a month. So, and this is where it, it actually shot up to 5,000 logins per second. So it's a very massive difference in peak time consumption versus regular consumption. And that highlights the user load hitting the CIM platform. So it's very important for this system to be able to cater to the change in request loads. So in typical system, there are two ways you can scale. One is vertical scaling. And you can go about this by adding on more computational resources into the system, and you can cater for a higher load. But the other one's also there, it's called horizontal scaling. And what we do there is you add more replicas to cater for the higher load. So when it comes to scaling, we need to understand that the average and the peak time load is gonna be different. And we need to be able to design the system or design it in a way that it caters both to the average load and the high load. So it also has the capability to scale well enough to cater for that high load so that we can get hit with it every now and then and we wouldn't actually have any issues. But implementing a system to cater for the peak high load all the time, it's gonna drain money and resources. So you need to have a CIM system with auto scaling support. And that's how it helps in this scenario. Auto scaling capabilities will make system automatically scale based on the load you get. So if the load increases, it'll spin off more servers. And if the load goes down, it will suspend the activity on the redundant servers. And this is where mature container technologies such as Docker, Kubernetes, and so forth, they actually help. So when you pick up a CIM solution for your needs, you need to check whether that solution supports similar technologies. CIM systems should also be able to provide failover and redundancy mechanisms to ensure that the system is always available. It needs to be able to look at, you know, this active instance will serve the load, but if something happens to it, you have a disaster recovery node, which will actually handle the load as well. And you should also consider deploying replicas in very diverse or geographically distributed data centers. And the reason for that is this way you can actually have a multi-regional deployment. So it helps you improve high availability. And it will also at the same time make sure that the data is available as close as possible to a customer's site or where the data needs to be used. And this helps increase performance and responsiveness of the system over a period of time. So CIM system should also be able to be deployed in the cloud. And if you take scenarios nowadays, you have organizations also asking for hybrid deployments or multi-cloud deployments. So these are just some of the scenarios we've seen at certain businesses nowadays. And if you address scalability, you have a very big topic coming up next. You got, okay, what happens to authentication, right? This controls the way people log in or customers log in. So it's very important. You have a lot of data breaches which happen due to weak, stolen, or maybe even default passwords. A lot of people actually go and they even utilize the same password. So they cycle through the same password for multiple sites, which is a risk, which is an issue. 
So when it comes to CIM systems, protecting user information is also a priority. So you can no longer simply rely on usernames and passwords alone. And that's where we need multi-factor authentication. With this, you add another security layer and you enforce different authentication factors. These authentication factors can be something you know, such as challenge questions, or something you have as a mobile phone or email account, or maybe even something you are, which is biometric authentication. So we can use these different authentication mechanisms along with the username and password, or maybe your primary authentication mechanism. So it helps improve security through the authentication phase. Adding MFA to your system, it helps you reduce account compromises to a very large degree. For example, Google lets you set up multi-factor auth if you like, but if you see the stats, 90% of Google users haven't actually enabled this. So you might actually think, what's the reason for this? Because it's giving you another additional level of security, right? But what happens from a user's perspective is let's say they enable MFA for multi-factor authentication. So they will always have to use a username and password to log in as a first factor or the first time, and then use, let's say an SMS for authentication for the second factor, right? So if you are sure that you're accessing the system from a very secure place or network, you may not actually be comfortable or even like using that additional step. It's not very user-friendly. So does it add security? Yes, it does. Is it very user-friendly? No, it adds an additional layer that the user has to do to get in to see the data that they wanna access. So even though MFA helps reinforce security, it hinders user experience. So in the CIM space, because we are so exposed to users, we need both security and usability at the same time. And that's where this adaptive authentication comes into the picture. It enforces different authentication mechanisms after evaluating a user's risk profile. So it can evaluate contextual information, such as the place the consumer try to access the system from, the time they try to access it as, or there's a time difference between them. It can connect to different fraud detection systems and it can get that information as well. So it helps you build a risk profile using all this information and it uses that risk profile to enforce authentication based on these risk factors. So let's take an example, you're at home, you've got your own devices, you've got your own network and you are sure that you're connected to all of this and it's secure. So in that situation, you might be okay to log in using a username and password, but let's say you fly to another country and there are very high, a very, very important questions you can ask about, oh, is my network secure? Am I connecting to a secure network? Or the devices that I'm using, are they secure enough? So if someone actually enforces some level of a contractual, an additional layer at that stage to help verify you are who you say you are and you've got access to the right stuff, it adds a level of safety around it. It helps build customer confidence. And we are happy in that scenario to use that additional authentication factor at that time. So in this case, adaptive authentication plays a very, very large factor because it can evaluate a lot of environmental or user scenarios to help calculate a risk profile or score where it can actively or proactively enforce single or multi-factor authentication. So it helps balance security and usability for the user. So it's very beneficial from a user point of view as well. So we speak about users getting into the system, right? And how would you go about analyzing all of this information, what they want to do with it? And this is where analytics comes into the picture. And when it comes to CM solutions, one of the key objectives is to also drive revenue growth by leveraging identity data to acquire new systems our new customers and retain those customers. So by transforming the data about user activities to information, we can make informed business decisions. We can perform marketing campaigns based on the information we collect. And we can also provide different offers based on the information we have collected over time. So there's three ways you can do analytics or you can go about sorting that out. The very first way is batch analytics. And that's where you generate insights of user information, with processing the data we have stored in our system. And then we can do some real-time analytics where we can generate insights 
by analyzing the real-time information we get when the users try to access the system or different transactions. You can also have things like predictive analytics, which is another way of doing it, where you use machine learning techniques to analyze the stored data. And by using this, you can predict the things the customer is going to do of which direction they're heading in. And that can help you look or calculate what your new requirements are going to be. So based on that, we can also come up with new offerings that we can implement or work towards. So CIM systems to this regard should also be able to generate reports from the data or the information we have generated. And based on these reports, we can create dashboards. And what happens with these dashboards is you can have senior executive level decisions being made by either management teams or marketing teams, which drastically affects business strategy. So come with this key KPIs we can see on these dashboards could be growth of customers or leads over time. You can also see the number of active customers in the system. You can differentiate between customers based on their geographical regions. So you, you can actually identify the frequent business features they also use in the system, um, identify different access patterns of the customer based on time and the devices they're logged on and so on. So we spoke about analytics and that brings me to the next pillar, which also goes hand in hand with it, which is security and privacy. So privacy is mostly about how much control you have over your own personal information. And what we've seen in the past, and this is like a gold standard, is that if organizations actually misuse customer information or data, there's gonna be consequences. If there's a data breach that happens, it can significantly damage the brand. So user data is critical in any CIM system. And when it comes to privacy standards or best practices, they continuously evolve. So any CIM solution that you come up with is adhered to these new privacy requirements enforced by countries in any given region. So one privacy standard most people talk about is GDPR. A lot of people hear about it nowadays, and it's been in effect for a couple of years. The primary focus of GDPR is to protect personal data and individual rights. And organizations wanting to do business within the European region have to adhere to this. But that isn't just localized to them. What GDPR also means is that you have other organizations in different countries, but they have to comply with it simply to deal with customers organizations within the European region. So privacy and security form a key part of our CIM platform. And we need to be able to clearly specify what data is being collected and how it will be used. We have to be able to give the control of this personal information or PII to the consumer. This can be done via a self-service portal where the consumers can log in and they can actually own the user information and they can manage it the way they want. So consent plays a very major role and privacy. And every action we perform with that personal information, without storing it or sharing it with other components, we have to get the customer's consent for that. So the customer should also have the control or the ability to change this consent or revoke it if necessary. So we have to implement these consent requirements or the privacy related requirements in our system, which means Privacy by design and privacy by default are also very key aspects of what we take into consideration while designing or implementing a CIM system. So yeah, these are the five pillars of CIM. Um, and just like you know, um, uh, a very brief uh, cover up all these of all these factors. Um, what we'd also like to do is just to have a very quick um, poll just to understand your interests around this topic. Um, so yeah, if you could uh, just trigger a quick poll, you should be able to see it on the screen very soon. Uh, what I'd also like to do is open the forum to any questions that you might have. I'm happy to try and answer them. We are a little short in time, but um, oh yeah, um, if you can't answer a question or cover it right now, I'm happy to get back to you with that information. So we have a question that's come through um, about mentioning integration with SIEM and UEBA, which are both important areas. So uh, this user said that UEBA is a hot topic in the organization. So they want to know for any CIM system, if there's a preference for what to integrate with SIEM or UEBA. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. 
Um, so SIEM and UEBA both cover or help you address um, uh, risks and security requirements, but um, depending on the size of the organization, uh, they can play very different roles. So what actually happens with UEBA, a user entity behavioral analytics, is that um, it's, it's very pro machine and system learning. So it's a, it's a lot more automated. Uh, whereas with SIEM, the rules tend to be a lot more static. So SIEM tends to be a favorite with organizations that are smaller, whereas with large organizations that have um, more funding, they tend to go with UEBA. Um, but this also helps address attack scenarios which SIEM and UEBA both help identify because SIEM looks at things from a very, uh, very um, standard or uh, straightforward attack scenario, whereas UEBA helps um, address cases which are a lot more dynamic or like larger attack vectors. So if you ask me, I would say, um, depending on the size of the organization, the funding you have to decide to go with SIEM or UEBA, but ideally, if you're planning on integrating with a SIEM system or UEBA system for CIAM, you should try and go for both because they both add value coming from different angles. Um, we do have another question. Um, a CIAM system typically produces a lot of important events example, change password, logout, et cetera. Is there a standard way of relaying these events to multiple interested subscribers? So, um, so my understanding of this question is um, with regards to events, and I'm gonna have to get a little bit more specific here. Um, there are different ways you can broadcast events, right? You can uh, go about different ways of publishing them as well. So one way is to actually go about putting it on a single log file. And you can then have, depending on the system you're trying to integrate with, you can then have maybe a local agent um, or subscriber kind of script running on that local server, which essentially picks up these events and then helps broadcast it to multiple interested subscribers. That's one way of going about it. Uh, another way is to actually send this through. So for API analytics, we have a feature where we send very important events through from our identity server platform to um, our analytics platform. And from there, we have different transports that are in place, which can broadcast that information, um, even using APIs to multiple interested parties or subscribers. So there's different ways you can address this, again, uh, coming down to requirements. Um, another thing about the question is you mentioned a lot of important events. Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, what I've seen in my experience is because we're actually doing a lot of these events, it's also important to understand what events would help you make a decision or what events are important to your use case, because that can actually help reduce data consumption, which is also going to help you with you know, um, funding and monetary requirements and help you save space as well. All right, well, um, I think they've covered those two questions. Um, if you have any other questions, you know, happy for you to reach out to either me or Nicole. Um, thank you so much for joining this call. Really do appreciate it. Um, yeah, well, looking forward to hearing from all of you guys. Have a very nice week. Cheers.